Hi everyone. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading our book, Searching for Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. This is the second book in the Enchanted Forest Chronicles, and it's published by Scholastic, who've been kind enough to let us read it to you. We're going to pick up where we left off with chapter seven, in which a wizard makes a mess and the journey begins. We have just had our heroes of the story, King Mendenbar and Princess Simmerine, uh, be attacked by Antarel, the son of Zemnar, the head wizard of the Society of Wizards. Antarel managed to create a giant nightshade, a very deadly creature, in the middle of one of the caverns in uh, Kazul's caves, and now Mendenbar and Simmerine are going to have to try to handle that somehow. So that's where we'll, we'll start. Chapter 7, in which a wizard makes a mess, and the journey begins. Ignoring Antarel, Mendenbar kept his eye on the nightshade. He had a moment's useless wish that he were in the enchanted forest, where he could have disposed of the monster with relative ease. Here things were going to be a lot more complicated. He shifted his grip on the sword and pulled at the power within it. The nightshade swung at him, its fully extended claws carving a whistling arc in the air. It was very, very fast. Mindenbar barely managed to block in time. The force of the blow knocked him to one side and he almost lo lost hold of his sword. The nightshade hissed in pain and shook its arm, but Mendenbar knew that it was not seriously hurt. Without active magic behind it, the most damage the sword could have inflicted on a nightshade this big was a bruise. Again, he pulled at the power in the sword, and then he had to roll to avoid another swing by the nightshade. This time he kept rolling until he was out of the monster's reach. He came up on one knee and pointed the sword at the nightshade, pushing power through the sword in the pattern the, that he had pictured in his mind. Antarel's staff struck him across the shoulders. The sword flew out of his hands and he went sprawling. His half-formed spell spun wildly in the air and then was sucked away. He heard an angry shriek from Simmerine and then a shout, Mendenbar, dodge left, quick! Without hesitation, Mendenbar threw himself to his left. He heard the rush of wind as the nightshade's claws missed him by inches. There was a splash somewhere behind him and Antarel's voice cried out, No! No! You'll be sorry for this, Simmerine! Then Mendenbar's hand closed on the hilt of his sword. He twisted and brought his sword up, shoving power through it recklessly. The blast of barely formed magic caught the nightshade in mid-leap. The creature hung frozen in the air for an instant and then dissolved in a cloud of bright sparks. Mendenbar seized the remnants of magic and pulled them together in a tight knot, ready to throw it at another nightshade or at Antarel himself. Only then did he pause to look around. Serene stood a little way away, swinging the empty bucket in one hand and looking at him as if she were impressed in spite of herself. Antarel, Antarel had vanished. You really do like flashy magic, Simmerine commented as Mendenbar climbed warily to his feet. I haven't seen anything like that since Kazul's coronation party. Where's Antarel? Mendenbar said. Did he get away? No, Simmerine said, waving her free hand at the damp area of floor to Mendenbar's right. I melted him. Melted him? Mendenbar looked at the damp patch more closely. Antarel's soggy robes were plastered to the floor in the middle of a gooey puddle. His staff lay along one side of the robes, half in, half out of the goo. There was no other trace of him. Mendenbar was impressed and said so. It's not really hard, Samarine said. All it takes is a bucket of soapy water with a little lemon juice in it. A friend of mine discovered it by accident, and I've kept the bucket ready ever since, just in case. I thought that only worked on witches. Samarine shrugged. Lots of things don't work the way that they're supposed to. Morwen's a witch, but she certainly doesn't melt in a bucket of soapy water. Mandibar thought of the shining stone step and the spotless wooden floor in Morwen's house and nodded. I can see that, but why does it work for wizards? We don't know. Serene gave him a sidelong look. I'm sorry I let Antero wallop you with his staff, but I didn't want to throw the water at him while you were in the way. What? Oh, you mean you were afraid that it would melt me too? Mendenbar blinked, but I'm not a wizard. You know how to work magic, Samarine pointed out, and I don't know how strict the soapy water and lemon juice trick is about defining wizards. It would cause a lot of trouble if I melted the king of the enchanted forest in the middle of Kazul's living room, even if it isn't permanent. You mean he'll be back? Mendenbar had started to pull his sword back in, put his sword back in his sheath, but he stopped at once. How soon? 
not for a couple days at least, Cimmerine reassured him. Antarell may be Zemnar's son, but he's never been a very good wizard. Antarell is the son of the head wizard, and Nibar shot a considering look at the puddle and the pile of soggy robes. So that's what he meant when he said his father would be pleased. Probably. Cimmerine frowned pensively at Antarell's staff. I've got to find Kazool. The Society of Wizards is up to something for sure, and she needs to know right away. Couldn't Antarell have come here on his own? Mendebar asked, although he didn't really believe it himself. Cimmerine shook her head. I don't think he'd have dared. As I said, he's not a very good wizard. He wouldn't have been able to keep himself concealed from the dragons, and he certainly must have had help to make anything as nasty and complex as that construct you took care of. That wasn't a construct, Mendebar said. That was a nightshade. They're fairly common in parts of the Enchanted Forest. Antarell didn't make it. He just snatched it from somewhere nearby. Snatched it? Cimmerine's eyes widened. Yes, I suppose he could have managed that. I, be I begin to see what you mean about traveling in the enchanted forest alone, she added in a thoughtful tone. I should hope so, Mendebar muttered, turning away. Then you've changed your mind about going, he added hopefully over his shoulder. No, just about whether I accept your offer of escort, Cimmerine said. It will probably be a nuisance, but nightshades would be much worse. Slightly startled by this unflattering comparison, Mendebar glanced back at Cimmerine. There was a decided twinkle in her eyes. Mendebar smiled and bowed elaborately. Thank you for your kind words, princess. You're welcome, your majesty, Cimmerine said, curtsying in response. Now we'd better get to work, or we'll never get this mess cleaned up in time to get to Flat Top Mountain before dark. Cleaning up the large cave took less time than Mendebar had expected, despite the unpleasantly gummy look of the goo that Antarell had left behind. A large part of the mess turned out to be left over soapy water, which was very convenient. Cimmerine mopped up most of it with Antarell's robe, then wrapped the robe around the staff and started towards the rear of the cave. What are you going to do with that? Mendebar asked curiously. Hide it, Cimmerine said. There's not about else much you can do to a wizard's staff. They won't break and even dragon's fire won't burn them. I know because we tried everything we could think of the last time we melted some wizards. We? Morwen and I. Antrell will get it back eventually, of course, but hiding it will slow him down a little. She left to dispose of the staff while Mendenbar scraped up the last of the goo. The kitchen was another matter. Cimmerine insisted on doing all the dishes that had been waiting for the sink to get them plugged, which took a while. Mendenbar offered to use his magic on the dishes, but Cimmerine politely de declined. A magic sword that does plumbing is unusual but very useful. She explained as she filled the sink. A magic sword that does dishes is just plain silly. Besides, there have been two big flares of magic in this cave in the past hour already, and if there's a third one, someone might come and see what I'm up to. I didn't notice anything remarkable when Antarell brought the nightshade in, Mandibar said, frowning, though I admit I overdid it when I got rid of the thing. I was in a hurry. Yes, of course, said Cimmerine, setting a clean plate on the drain board. But were you in a hurry when you unclogged the stink? That was the other flare I meant, not Antarell's fiddling. What was conspicuous about that? Mendebar asked defensively. He picked up a clean towel and began drying plates. It was a perfectly ordinary spell. Cimmerine looked at him. Right, just like that sword is a perfectly ordinary magic sword. Well, I wouldn't call it ordinary exactly, but that's because it's linked with the enchanted forest, Mendebar said. Outside of that, it's nothing special. Nothing special? Cimmerine stopped washing for dishes, dishes for a moment to stare at him. Suddenly she frowned. You mean it. You really haven't noticed. Notice what? The way that sword of yours positively reeks of magic, Cimmerine said. We're going to have to do something about it, unless you want the Society of Wizards to be able to find this with their eyes closed. Mendemar looked at her. She was perfectly serious. He set the dish towel down and drew his sword. It didn't look or feel any different to him from the way that it normally felt, but Cimmerine winced. Can't you tone it down a little? I still don't know what you're talking about, Mendebar said, irritated. And even if I did, I wouldn't have the slightest idea how to go about toning it down. Why not? It's your sword, isn't it? It didn't come with directions. Most of them don't. Cimmerine shook her head at him and picked up another dirty teacup out of the rapidly diminishing stack. Maybe there's something in Kazul's treasury that will take care of it. I'll check as soon as we're done here. 
When the dishes were finished and the kitchen tidied to suit Simmerine's exacting standards, she left Benimbar to mull things over while she went off to investigate the treasury. Benimbar was glad of a chance to think. What is the Society of Wizards doing? He muttered. Between the misleading things Zamnar had said to Mendenbar and the downright lies Antarell had told to Simmerine, it was clear that the wizards did not want them comparing notes. Simmerine might even be right about their desire to start a war between the Enchanted Forest and the dragons. Starting a war, however, would take more than a misunderstanding between the king of the Enchanted Forest and Kazul's chief cook and librarian. Were the wizards behind the mysterious burned area Mendenbar had found? They could have gotten hold of Warog's scales, and they certainly could have enchanted them. But why would they do it? Menivar asked the sink. They're not stupid, at least some not isn't, and a war would cause the society as almost as many problems as it would cause us. What could make them overlook the problems and try to stir up trouble anyway? The sink did not answer. But if it wasn't the wizards, Menivar wondered, who was it? Where had Kazul disappeared to? And why was was there really dragon's bane being farmed in the enchanted forest? Or was that just a rumor someone was spreading to add to the confusion? He was still trying to put his questions into some sort of order when Simmerine returned. She had exchanged the apron and the rust-colored dress for a dark blue tunic with matching leggings, a pair of tall black boots, and a maroon cloak. She had taken off her crown, and her braids were wound neatly around her head. A gold-handled sword hung at her side next to a small belt, pa belt pouch. She held out a sword belt in a sheath, the leather gray with age. I think that this will do the job, she said. Try it and see. I've already got a sheath, Mendevar pointed out. Yes, but this one blocks magic, Simmerine explained. It'll keep your sword from being so, so obvious all the time. At least I hope it will. If you say so, Mendevar replied, taking the scabbard. He held it a moment, testing it. It didn't feel magical, but then that was the idea. He shrugged and pulled out his sword and put it in the sheath that Simmerine had given him. Oh, that's much better, Simmerine said with evident relief. I can hardly notice anything now. I can, Menivar said, touching the hilt with a frown. The pulse of the enchanted forest was still there, ready for him to use it. Of course you can, Simmerine said. It's your sword. Well, I suppose I don't mind using it then, Menivar said, as long as it doesn't damage a sword. It won't, Simmerine promised. <clears throat> Menimar took the sword belt and set it aside, and then buckled on the belt and scabbard, took off his sword belt and set it aside, and then buckled on the belt and scabbard that Simmerine had given him. All right, he said, let's go. As they left the cave, Simmerine muttered, muttered something under her breath and waved the entrance. Menimar jumped as a coil of strong, hard magic sprung into place behind them. Looking over his shoulder, he saw a solid wall of rock. He transferred his gaze to Simmerine and raised an eyebrow. What kind of magic was that? Just something Kazula and I worked out a while back, Simmerine said. It's to keep wizards and knights and so forth from prowling around while I'm gone. So Simmerine is a sorceress, as well as a cook and a librarian, and goodness knows what else, Mendebar thought to himself. Every time he thought he had her figured out, she would surprise him again. It's a good idea, but please warn me if you're going to do anything like that again, he said. I'm not in the mood for being startled, if you know what I mean. Simmerine so nodded, frowning slightly, and asked him and asked just what it was about the spell that had startled him. This led to a long technical discussion of the various ways of casting spells, detecting spells, and comparing spells other people had cast. Mendivar found it both interesting and informative. He had always known that his own methods of working magic were not much like anyone else's, but he had never had time to study other styles. Simmerine knew something about most kinds of magic, and she was naturally very well informed indeed about dragon magic. She was as interested in Mendenbar's system as he was in everything else, and the conversation lasted all the way to Flat Top Mountain. The sun had slipped behind the mountains, and it was almost dark when they came to the foot of the last slope. Mendenbar could see the giant's castle at the top, large and dark and ominous against the graying sky. A broad road wrapped three times around the mountain as it wound its way up to the castle gates. Are you sure that this is the right place? he asked. Quite sure, Simmerine said. I've never been here before myself, but Kazul has described it often enough, and that's certainly a giant's castle. Exactly, Menivar said, but it is, is it the right giant? Well, we won't find out standing here. Come on. Simmerine marched confidently up the mountain. 
Shaking his head, Menendlar followed. By the time that they reached the castle gates, the stars were beginning to come out, and it was getting hard to see. There ought to be a bell pull or a knob, Simarine said. You check that side of the gate, and I'll take this one. All right, but what? A loud grounding noise interrupted Menendlar in mid-sentence, and the gate swung open. Yellow light spilled across the road, making Menendlar and Simarine squint. Come in, travelers, a woman's voice said, much too pleasantly. Come in and make yourselves comfortable for the night. Neither Mendebar nor Simarine moved. This was your idea in the first place, Mendebar said softly to Simarine. What do we do now? Ask questions, Simarine replied just as softly. She raised her voice and said, Thank you for your kind hospitality, but we are not just traveling. We are looking for the giantess, Balamor, and we're in a hurry. So if you're not Balamor, we will have to go on. I am Balamor, said the voice, still in an artificially pleasant tone that made Mendibar's skin crawl. Who are you? I'm Princess Simmerine, chief cook and librarian to Gazul, the king of the dragons, and this is Mendibar, the king of the enchanted forest, Simmerine answered. Simmerine? The voice said in an entirely different manner. Oh, good, I've been wanting to meet you for the longest time. Come on in, you and your friend, and I'll have supper ready in a jiffy. Menembar and Simarine looked at each other. I think it's all right now, Simarine said after a moment. Well, we won't find out standing here, Menembar said. He held out his arm. Shall we go in, princess? Simarine gave him a bright, almost impish smile, and laid her fingertips on his arm as if they were walking into a court hall. I should be pleased to accompany you, your majesty. Together they walked through the gate. The courtyard inside was high and wide and empty except for two rows of blazing torches and iron holders that lined up on either side of the path. Mendebar and Simarine paced up to the door, which swung open just as the gates had, only without the grinding. As they went in, they heard the castle gates crunching shut. A moment later, the doors closed silently behind them. They stood in the stone hall three times the size of any that Mendebar had ever seen. A wood table, surrounded by high back chairs, stretched the length of the hall. At the far end of the room, a large fire burned in an op open hearth. High on the walls, more torches lit up the room. A brown-haired woman in a pale blue dress was bending over a cauldron that hung from the iron hook above the fire. It all looked very ordinary until Menabar noticed that the seats of the chairs were level with his eyes and everything else was similarly, similarly oversized. The brown-haired woman sniffed at the cauldron, nodded to herself, and straightened. Welcome, she said, coming forward. I'm Balamor. You must be Princess Simmerine. I'm so pleased to meet you at last, after all Kazul has told me about you. The giantess bent over to shake hands gently with Simmerine. She was at least three times as tall as Mendibar, but she moved with a grace that suited her size. Simmerine returned the handshake gravely and said, I hope Kazul hasn't given you the wrong idea about me. Not at all, I'm sure, said the giantess. Is this your young man? You're not running away from the dragons after all this time, are you? Certainly not, Simmerine said with unnecessary vehemence. I'm very happy with my job. Of course, Balamor said, sounding disappointed. She gave Menembar a speculative look and then leaned in towards Simmerine. If I were you, I'd reconsider, she said in a loud whisper. Your young man does not look like the patient type. No, no, Simmerine said, reddening. It's not like that at all. This is the king of the enchanted forest, and he came to see Kazul, only Kazul has gone to visit her grandchildren and isn't home. That's why we came to see you, to borrow a magic carpet so we can find Kazul. Oh, I see, said the giant guest. Strictly business. Well, you'll have to wait until after supper. Dublin will be home any minute, and he hates when his meals are late. Dublin? Menibar said with some misgiving. My husband, said Balamor. There was a loud crash from the courtyard outside, followed by a thud, thud, thud of heavy footsteps that shook the castle. Balamor straightened with a happy smile. Here he comes now. Chapter 8, in which they give some good advice to a giant. Menembar and Simmerine turned to face the castle floors, the castle doors as the footsteps drew nearer. A moment later, the doors flew open and the giantess's husband stepped into the hall. He was a giant's head taller than she was, with wild brown hair, and a beard like large, untidy broom's head. He carried a club that was as long as Mendenbar was tall. Just inside, the giant stopped and sniffed the air. 
Then he sneezed once, scowled ferociously, and in a voice that shook the torches in their brackets said, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. Be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Balamor shook her head. Nonsense, dear, it's just Princess Cimmerine and the King of the Enchanted Forest. And neither of us are English, Cimmerine added. The giant squatted down to her. Are you positive about that? Sure, Mendebar said. Well, the giant sniffed again experimentally and then lowered his club with a sigh. That's all right, then. I wasn't in the mood for more work tonight anyway. Sorry about the mistake. It must be this cold in my head. I told you yesterday to take something for it, Balimar scolded, and I told you this morning to wrap some flannel around your throat before you went out. But do you listen to me? No. I listen, the giant protested uncomfortably, but I can't ransack villages with a piece of flannel around my neck. It wouldn't look right. Severine snorted softly. Menembar got the distinct impression that she didn't think much of doing things for the sake of appearances. Well, really, Doblin, Balamor said, how do you think it looks when you're coughing and sneezing all over everything while you're ransacking? Have a little sense. I'd rather have a little dinner, Doblin said and sneezed again. If you sound like that tomorrow, you're staying home in bed, Balamor informed her husband. I can't do that. I'm scheduled to pillage two villages and maraud half a county. You're in no condition to pillage a hen house, much less a village, Balamor declared. Besides, you've earned a bit of rest. What with all of that extra time that you've been putting in lately, looting and marauding and I don't know what all. That's not the point. It's precisely the point. You're just being stubborn because you think having a bad cold is ungiant like Well, it is. Balamor shook her head and looked at Summary. Men, she said in tones of disgust. And don't you say men to me, Doblin said. It's my job we're talking about. Maybe you should try a different line of work, Mendebar suggested. Eh? Doblin peered down at him with interest. Like what? Consulting, Mendebar thought, said at random because he hadn't actually thought about it. Consulting? You know, said Simmerine, giving advice to people. You could teach other giants the best way of of ravaging and pillaging and marauding, and you could tell villagers the best way to keep giants away. With all your experience, I bet you'd be good at it. I never thought of that, Doblin said, rubbing his chin. I don't, I don't know why not, Baltimore well, said. It's a very good idea, and you wouldn't be out in all sorts of weather, catching cold and flu and goodness knows what else. Plundering has gotten to be an awful lot of work lately. The giant admitted. It'd be a relief to stop. I'm getting too old to tramp through fields. I understand that consulting plays very well, too, Menabar told him. I'll do it, Doblin said with sudden decision. Tomorrow morning, first thing. Thank you for the suggestion. What did you say your name was? If you'd listen once in a while, you wouldn't have to ask me to repeat everything, Balamor said. This is Princess Cimmerine, the one who... Uh, the one who's been with Kazool for the last year or so, and gave me that marvelous biscuit recipe you like so much. And her young man is the king of Enchanted Forest, who she is not running away with yet. Menivar choked and shot an apprehensive look at Cimmerine. She rolled her eyes and made a face at him, but did not say anything, having apparently decided that it was a waste of effort to correct the giantess. Pleased to meet you, princess, Doblin said solemnly. Nice to see you, king. What brings you to Flat Top Mountain? They say it's business, Balamor said before either Cimmerine or Benabar could answer. Then it will have to wait until after dinner, Doblin announced. I never discuss business at dinner, or with dinner for that matter, he winked at Cimmerine. Besides, I'm hungry. He sneezed a third time. Excuse me. Balamor began scolding again as Cimmerine and Benabar nodded politely. Menivar was just beginning to wonder how long they were going to have to stand next to the table when Balamor shooed her husband to a seat at one end and started for the other herself, saying over her shoulder, Simmerine, dear, you and the king are on the right. Just walk around the chair. It's all set up. With some misgiving, Menivar escorted Simmerine past Doblin's chair towards the seat that Balamor had indicated. As they approached, she saw that the giantess had not been exaggerating. A set of normal-sized wooden steps, equipped with wheels as to be easily movable, stood next to the giant right-hand chair, and two ordinary chairs were perched side by side on the seat on the top. 
The combination was Mendebar discovered exactly the right height to reach the table. Apparently, Balamor was accustomed to having smaller people at dinner, for the plates and glasses were all the usual size as well. For as long as Mendebar did not look down, it was easy to pretend he was sitting at an ordinary dinner table. The food was very good. They started with fresh greens and went on to a roast pig with cranberries, mushrooms and wine, and some sort of lumpy vegetable in a thick brown sauce that disguised it completely and tasted marvelous. There, were great de there was a great deal of everything. Mendobar supposed that this was only to be expected at a giant's table, but Balamar did not seem to realize that a person who was only a third of her size would have a smaller appetite as well. She filled and refilled Mendobar's plate until he was ready to burst. Near the end of the meal, Simarine leaned over and whispered, Don't take any dessert. Why not? Mendobar asked. Balamar's using her cauldron of plenty, Simarine said, and it doesn't do desserts very well. So unless you liked burnt mint custard or sour cream and onion ice cream, I see, Menembar said quickly, then it's a good thing that I couldn't eat another bite even if I wanted to. When dinner was over, Simarine brought up the question of the magic cart. Balamor nodded, nodded once. Of course you can borrow a cart, Simarine dear. Carpet, uh, Simarine dear, I'll just take a look around and see what you have. You won't find much, said her husband, and sneezed loudly. That last Englishman you let in took in most of them. You should have let me find him and grind his bones like I'm supposed to. Nonsense, said Balamor, frowning at her husband. We can afford a few cheap magic harps and a coin or two. I keep the good silver and mother's jewelry in the top cover where they can't reach. Besides, they're always such nice boys. Huh, said Dublin, beggars and thieves, if you ask me, and boring at that. What makes you say that? Menabar asked curiously. They always do the same thing. Come in, ask for a meal, hide, and then run off with a harp or a bag full of money the minute I fell asleep, Dublin said. And they're always named Jack. Always. We've lived in this castle for twenty years, and every three months, regular as clockwork, one of those boys shows up. And there's never been a Tom or a Dick or a Harry among them. Just Jacks. The English have no imagination. About the carpet, Simarine reminded him. Oh, that. Well, the last Jack wasn't musical, and he cleaned a set of magic carpets instead of harps. Joblin sneezed again and began to cough. Bed for you, dear, Balamor said firmly and shooed her husband out of the room. She followed him closely, muttering to herself about cough syrup and vaporizers and hot tea with lemon and honey. Mendenbar and Simarine looked at each other. Is there anywhere else that we could borrow a carpet? Mendenbar asked. Not that I know of, Simarine said with a worried frown. We'll just have to walk. Drat, it will take days. We could go back to the Enchanted Forest and... There, said Baltimore, coming in free, briskly in the room and cutting Mendenbar off mid-sentence. He'll be much better in the morning. I'm afraid he's right about carpet, Simarine, dear. But I'll just have a look around and see if there isn't something, something stuck off in a corner somewhere. I can't believe that we're completely out. It's quite all right, Simarine said. We'll manage somehow. Nonsense, dear, Baltimore said in the same tone that she used with her husband. It would be quite an adventure, seeing what's stuck off in corners and so on. I haven't been in some of the storage rooms in years. It was clear that nothing that they could say would shake her resolve, and after a token protest, they gave in. Balamor showed them to a pair of comfortable, a pair of comfortably furnished rooms, and left them for the night. Mendebar did not object, even though it was still fairly early. The long walk from the dragon's cave had been very tiring. He lay down on the bed and fell asleep at once. Breakfast the next morning was cinnamon-flavored porridge, milk, and toast with blueberry jam. Mendelbar found it waiting on the high table in the central hall when he left his room to look for his hosts. There was no one around, but the giant-sized dishes and crumbs at either end of the table showed that Balamor and Doblin had already eaten. Mendelbar climbed up the stairs to his seat and began dishing up the porridge. Before he had finished filling his bowl, Simarine walked into the room, peering around for the giants. "'Good morning,' Mendelbar called. Madame Balamor and her husband appear to have been and gone, but they've left an excellent breakfast. Would you care to join me? I'd be delighted, Simarine called back and climbed the stairs to join him. I had no idea giants were such early risers, she said as she sat down on the second chair. Where do you suppose she's gone? Gone, said Balamor's voice from the hallway at the end of the room. Dear, dear, I thought there was a left enough porridge for the pair of you, but it'll take a minute to make some more. There's plenty of breakfast. Mendebar said quickly. We were talking about you and Doblin. 
but he was supposed to wait for you, Baltimore said, emerging from the hall. She inspected the room over the top of the large bundle she was carrying and then shook her head. Isn't that just like a man? Simmerine, dear, I found just the thing for you. I knew there would be something upstairs, no matter what Doblin said. Are you quite certain that you have enough porridge? Quite certain, Simmerine said. What? Baltimore! Baltimore, where's the inkwell? Doblin's voice echoed down the corridor, interrupting Simmerine mid-sentence. Where are you? I can't find anything around here when I want it. It's because you never look in the right place, dear, Bob Marco. The inkwell is in the kitchen next to the grocery list, where it's been the past six months. And I'm in the dining room, which is where you would be if you'd done what I asked you, instead of wandering off in all direction. I didn't wander off, Doblin objected, sticking his head into the room. I went to get some paper and ink so I could write a letter. Oh, good morning, princess. King, I didn't see you. You were supposed to see them, Balamor said, exasperated. You were supposed to be here when... Oh, never mind. Well, if you're done scolding, could you find me that inkwell? Balamor shook her head and set her bundle down on a chair and went off to deal with her erring husband. Mandivar looked at Samarine and they burst out laughing at the same time. Oh dear, said Samarine when she got her breath back. I hope they didn't hear. Are they always like this? Mandivar asked. I don't know, Simmerine admitted. This is the first time that I've been here. Kazool has always been the one to, that comes to talk or borrow things. The thought wiped the smile from her face. I hope she's safe. You'd know if she wasn't, Menabar said, hoping that he was right. Being king of dragons is a little bit like being in king of the enchanted forest. If anything drastic happens to you, everybody knows. Well, I suppose to, so, Simmerine said. I know perfectly well that she can take care of herself, but I'd still feel a lot better when we find out where she is. There wasn't much that Mandibar could say to that. They ate in silence for a few minutes, and they were just finishing up when Balmore and Doblin returned. Doblin was carrying several sheets of white paper and a pen made of fe a feather as long as Mandibar's arm. Balmore held an inkwell the size of a sink. The giantess cleared away the dishes from the far end of the table and set the ankle gently in place, then steered her husband to the chair. When she had him settled, she picked up the bundle that she had brought out earlier. I'll just take this outside and shake the dust out, she told Simmerine. You and your young man can come along as soon as you finish eating. Don't rush. How do you spell resignation? Dublin asked, nibbling on the end of his feather pen. Vendemar spelled it out for him as Balmore bustled out the door. He and Simmerine finished their breakfast with only occasional interruption from Doblin. Leaving the giant mumbling over his letter and chewing the tattered end of his pen, they went out to see what Balmore had found. There you are, Balmore said as they came out to the courtroom. I've got most of the dust out and it's ready to go. What do you think? She stepped back and Medimar got his first good look at the carpet. It was enormous, with a three-foot fringe on all four sides. In places it looked rather worn, and there was a hole the size of a teacup in one corner. The background was a rich cream color, dotted with teddy bears a foot long. Pink teddy bears. Bright pink. It's certainly large enough, Menabar said at last. Are you sure it will fly? Samarine asked, looking dubiously at the hole. Oh yes, Balmore assured her. It's the very best quality, but we haven't used it in years. Because of the pattern. She gestured at the teddy bears. Dublin thought that they just didn't look right in a giant's castle. I think I agree with him, Menembar said under his breath, eyeing the pink teddy bears with dislike. No wonder that Jack Feather didn't take it. As long as it flies, I don't care what it looks like, Simmerine declared. Thank you so much, Balamore. I'll make sure you get it back as soon as we're through with it. There's no rush, Balamore said. It'll just go back in the attic. How does it work? Menembar asked. I couldn't find the instruction manual, but it's perfectly simple. Balmorris told him. All magic carpets are the same. You sit in the middle and you say, up, up, and away, to make it take off, and you steer by leaning in the direction that you want to go. What about stopping? Balmor frowned in concentration. I believe you're supposed to say, whoa, but cut it out carpet works just as well. I'm sorry I can't be more definite. It's been a long time. Right. Menevar looked at Simmerine. Are you sure that you want to do this? Simmerine hesitated, then nodded firmly. We'll manage. If I could think of some other way of getting to the north end of the mountains quickly, I would. Come on. She stepped onto the carpet and plopped down in the center. Uh, with some misgiving, Mandibar sat next to her. Oh, 
Heavens, I nearly forgot, Balmore said suddenly. Stay right there, said Marine Deer. I'll be back in a flash. Now what? Minibar asked as the giantess hurried back in the castle. Maybe she remembered where the instruction manual is, Samarine said. Somehow, I doubt it, Menabar said. A moment later, Balmor came hurrying out again, carrying a large bag. I packed you a bit of lunch, he explained, handing Samarine the package. Goodness knows what you'll find out there in the mountains. Samarine thanked Balmor again and set the bag between herself and Menabar, and then said, All right, carpet, up, up, and away. The carpet shuddered, shifted, and rose slowly in the air. Smiling broadly, Simmerine waved at Balamore and then leaned forward. The carpet shivered again and then began to move. It sailed up out of the castle and into the sky over the mountains, gathering speed as it went. And that's where we're going to stop today. The next chapter is called In Which They Discover the Perils of Borrowed Equipment. And that will be the chapter that we start with next week when we pick up with our book that we're reading, Searching for Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy published by Scholastic. Thank you for joining me today. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.